me. I started to feel at home in a craft, in a discipline, in, a, in an art form. Um, and it was sort of the connection and, and community that came out of that very collaborative art form where I started to feel uh, sort of memories and feelings uh, falling into place for me. Even though those are hinged on my reality as a white boy growing up in middle class, uh, a middle class home in, in the new South, if you will, um, it, that sense of home was starting to set in for me. It was only until later uh, mm -hmm. when I was started to, to get a little older that I started to realize that the theater and for that matter, art of all kinds could start to become a space to confront different perspectives, a space for representation, a home for artists of color, members of the LBGTQ community and so many other diversities that sort of make humanity so rich and beautiful. Um, so I love this theme, it gets me excited um, and it's sort of aligned with what Tim and I are doing at Charlotte is Creative. I mean, we here we are 35 years later after yeah. last year and I'm running this nonprofit called Charlotte is Creative with Tim and, and our, our goal is to change the narrative of Charlotte, that it's, it is an incredibly creative place and that we're supporting and promoting and advocating for our fellow creatives so that they feel at home here, so they feel supported and seen. So I love this theme. And I want to toss it back to you. Like, what are your feelings about this theme before we move over to the panelists? Yeah, absolutely, Matt. I love that. And honestly, I love this theme as well because it challenges us also to see how everybody's perspective of home is different, even in the same place, right? So quite different from you, Matt. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> so I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I moved here to the beautiful Queen City when I was 13. So I went to Sedgefield Middle, Myers Park High, and UNC Charlotte. And I remember with each of those stages in my life, it was a different experience. Sedgefield Middle and Dilworth. Then we have Myers Park and Myers Park and even UNC Charlotte in the university area. So being able to see how all of these places had different cultures and looks and experiences was different, but also being a transplant, right? And also being an Afro-Latina, which was different because in New York, nobody assumes a culture, nobody assumes anything on you and moving here, being asked to like, you know, if you speak Spanish, prove it. Um, and so those are just some accounts of where it was like, okay, even though Charlotte is home and I love me some Queen City, it was how can I take all of those experiences to make sure that a lot like Charlotte is creative, the family that you, you all are for me, uh, Matt and Tim, is how can we take all of these experiences and have some real talk, some real dialogue and discussion about how, how home, though we have different experiences and perspectives, can be a safe space for everybody. So currently I'm reporting live from Dup and Swat, um, literally next door from my at Black Market. And what I love about this place is it definitely provides a sense of home for me as a creative because, listen, a big part of feeling like home is having that authenticity. So being able to talk your talk, walk your walk, not feeling like you have to shrink, not feeling like you don't have a voice. And that's why I'm really excited about this talk because it's it's bringing together all of these deferring perspectives. It's bringing together um, just all of our communities. And I think that it's very necessary for such a time as this. So definitely, definitely grateful. Yes, art builds bridges and understanding. And that's what we want to do today at home. Isn't that right, Matt? That's exactly <laughs> right. I, I always love your perspective on these things. And so um, clearly there's a lot of work to be done in Charlotte. You know, you and, and we and Tim and everyone here, we're so honored to be and grateful to be doing it alongside so many amazing creatives here in, in the Queen City, so many of whom are on tonight's uh, panel. So um, what I want to do real quick is go over kind of the agenda and then we'll meet the panel. So very simple agenda tonight. We're going to have a, a, a part one of the panel discussion and that'll probably be about 40 minutes in length. And then we will shift into a Q&A and I want everyone who, have, who is tuning in to know that if you have questions that pop up, please put them in the chat and we will get to those questions or as many as we can when we move into that Q&A section. We will then shift back over to part two of the panel discussion, which is going to be exclusively questions that were submitted by our panelists. No, um, so we have a new twist on that, and then we'll end with some final Q&A. So that's kind of our agenda for this evening. Drop your questions and comments into the chat function while we are uh, having this conversation. And Ohavia, why don't you introduce our first uh, panelist? Absolutely. So I'm so excited about this whole panel, but I will say very to introduce this person. Good friend of mine, you all, I would like to present to you David Butler. David J. Butler, aka Dave Has Wings, which is a fact, friends, is an artist and creative consultant working arts, education, and culture. He's a Charlotte native, owner of Analog Luxury, founding member of Hugh House, shout out to the Hugh House family, and director of community initiatives at the Whitaker Group. David, thank you so much for joining us. Matt, who else? Thank you guys want? for having me. Yeah, Dave, it's great to have you here. Okay, um, we're going in alphabetical order here. So uh, that's the way we've decided to do this. 
Our next panelist is Krista Camaroto. She is one of the artists in, in the uh, home exhibit. She is an interdisciplinary artist with strong roots in photography and environmental art. She has had 15 years teaching in academia and 15 years in art administration. She currently continues her practice as an artist while also working as an art instructor at Gaston College and as an independent curator. And as former director of galleries at UNC Charlotte and former artistic director of the Light Factory, she has been awarded two NEA grants, a Maplethorpe Foundation grant, four North Carolina Arts Council grants, and four Charlotte Mecklenburg Arts and Science Council grants. Woo! She is a prolific grant receiver, I'll say, but she's also a prolific <laughs> interdisciplinary artist with numerous residents, and her work can be found in the Beckler Contemporary Collection, the Denver Museum of Art, Special Collections at UNC Charlotte. Her new Terraforma series was on view at the Mint in spring of 2019. Krista, it is awesome to have you on this panel tonight. Lovely to be with all of you. Yes, indeed, Matt. But listen, the powerhouse panel just keeps growing, okay? Next, I have the amazing opportunity to introduce to you all Allie Brown. Allie Brown is president and chief executive officer of McCall Center for Art and Innovation, a nationally recognized artist residency and contemporary art space here in Charlotte. She is working to transform McCall Center by amplifying the organization's focus on local artists and expanding offerings to support the artists who live and work in Charlotte. Ali, thank you so much for joining us. So, hey, yeah, glad to be here. Ali, I miss seeing you in the school parking lot. That's all I'm gonna say. I miss seeing you in the, in the pickup line. All right, our next panelist is Amy Herman. We love Amy, she's an artist based here in Charlotte. She received her MFA in photography from Columbia College, Chicago, and her BFA in fine arts from Michigan State University. Photographs have been shown on the international level and are included in the permanent collections at the Pio Soto Museum of Photography, Castle Haas, no I'm messing that up, and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. She founded Vintage Charlotte otherwise known as VTG CLT, Vintage Charlotte and Goodyear Arts. Amy, it's awesome that you're here with us tonight. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes, indeed. I'm telling you, Matt, don't we have like the best people? I just got to say it. Next up, we have Mr. Todd Herman. After a brief career in genetic research at Johns Hopkins Hospital, catch that y'all, in Baltimore, Todd went back to school to get a master's and PhD in art history with a specialty in 16th century Venetian and drawing. He has been director of the Mint Museum of Art for two years after serving as director of the Arkansas Art Center in Little Rock for seven years. He has taught art history at colleges and universities in the United States and in Italy. Come on, that's a different flex. We love to see it, Todd. <laughs> and organized exhibitions and written about subjects ranging from from the Italian Renaissance to Mark Rothko in the 1940s. Todd, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. I would imagine the list of people who have gone from genetic research into museum production is short. I'm just right. kind of, it, It's not the typical path, I will say. No, no. <laughs> we have a pair of Todd's with us tonight because Todd Smith currently serves as, our, as the executive director of the Beckler Museum of Modern Art. And prior to the Beckler, Todd has led, uh, has led the Orange County Museum of Art, the Tampa Museum of Art, the Gibbs Museum of Art in Charleston, the Knox, Knoxville Museum of Art, and the Plains Art Museum in Fargo. He's curator of American and Contemporary Art at the Mint Museum from 1997 to 2000. Todd Smith, thanks for being here with us. It's, it's great to be here. It's great to be back in Charlotte. Thanks for having me. Welcome home. Yeah, Let's totally. Home. I'm, I'm just so happy we have two Todds, Matt. It's like amazing. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> next, up, <laughs> next up, I would like to present to you all Alexis J. Taylor. Alexis is the former collections and exhibitions manager for the Harvey B. Gantt Center for African American Arts and Culture. Alexis managed over, y'all catch this, 20 exhibitions and curated, organized several shows for the Gantt. Since the age of 13, Alexis has called Charlotte home. Hey, Alexis, good to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Last but not least, of course, it is the, it is the third artist in the home exhibition it is J. Stacy Utley. He was born on the Lockenheath Air Force Base in Suffolk, England, and raised in Raleigh, North Carolina. Stacy Utley is a critically acclaimed artist whose work addresses complex narratives found within the African American diaspora. The buildings, shapes, and figures in his work are heavily influenced by his background as an architect and are used to address topics such as race politics, gentrification, and other narratives found in the home. Stacy, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Hi, good evening. Thank you guys for having me. 
Yes, indeed. So friends, like we said, you're in the right place at the right time. And Matt, I am so excited. Matt, we ready to get to the questions? Let's dive in. Let's have, let's have some, some conversation about home. Yes, absolutely. Let's get to it. So Dave, honestly, I'm going to direct this question to you first and then we'll do a round robin. But Dave, I wanted to ask, as an artist, do you feel at home in Charlotte? Why or why not? Um, so it's a little bit biased for me. I feel at home just because this is my home, right? Like as a native, um, I definitely feel at home. I, do I feel like there are um, enough opportunities, enough resources? Do I feel like we have a full blown ecosystem that helps support um, artists? Do I feel like we have a bunch of creative industry? I do not. Um, so for me, I kind of have to separate that question into two. Um, I love Charlotte. It's like I said, it's my hometown. I was born and raised here. Um, but I definitely think we have some work to do as it relates to being able to recruit and develop and uh, push artists forward. I think there's a lot of opportunity in that space. No, 100%. And I'm so glad that you brought that up too as well, Dave, is you born and bred here. Like this is home for you, but that perspective is definitely welcome. Matt, did you want to say anything to that? Well, um, I, I would love actually, because it's sort of a kickoff question. So I think it'd actually be sort of cool to hear from our other two artists on this to Krista, would you like to um, sort of take a swing at that question as well? And then we'll-, sure. we'll Stacey. Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I grew up as a suburban kid, I'm gonna say that, a very white suburban kid. Um, outside of New York City and Long Island and outside of DC. And when I came to Charlotte, I was brought here uh, to the creative belly button of Charlotte through the Light Factory. So I was immediately um, schooled in community and grassroots leadership um, and that people matter and that what you do today is gonna matter 20 years from now. So that was really helpful. So the social capital that I feel in Charlotte is tremendous. And I, I have to say, it's one of the biggest gifts of my lifetime. But I do think, although I've watched Charlotte grow to be very much more metropolitan, I do think that we need to really educate our city to value art and arts organizations much more. There's not a big market for buying art. There's not a big enough habit of constantly supporting arts organizations. So. And I also think that, you know, we have a 35% demographic of African American people, and we should have 35% of that programming in everything we do, you know, and we have a 15 or 14% Latinx, which is probably really truly outside of the census 20%. So what we do should be reflective of that too. Absolutely. No, absolutely, Krista. Thank you for sharing that perspective. There's something that you said was so good is teaching people how to value the art here in the city because we do have plenty of it. And that's definitely key. Stacey, I'm going to toss this question over to you as an artist. Do you feel at home here in Charlotte? Why or why not? Sure. Um, well, to answer your question, yes. Um, we've, uh, my wife, my family and I have been in Charlotte since 2008. And uh, we moved to Charlotte to be closer to the family. And it was at the time that I was really considering pursuing my art. And for me, it was not the most idealistic move to, to move to Charlotte. I kept thinking I need to be in a place like New York or DC or, you know, a, a bigger city. Um, so I always give my wife credit for saying, you know, Charlotte, is, I think Charlotte's where we need to be. And that kind of goes back to answering the question earlier, like what is home and home is basically where you grow. And sometimes it's not where you expect it. And so Charlotte is definitely a place where I've definitely grown as an artist um, because I came here and I ended up meeting a lot of people in the community. And it's amazing how you meet people that impact your life that kind of help you grow as an artist. Um, people that I think like Chad Cartwright, right? um, Jessica Moss, Juan and Jan uh, Janelle Logan, um, you know, pe people like that I met when I first came to Charlotte that um, have always kind of been around, supported me, um, poured into me and sustained me as an artist. And I, and I hope that I do the same as well. So I think it's the community here um, of artists all working towards a common goal um, that uh, makes me feel um, at home here. So, yes. Absolutely. I love that. But the key that I really want to like lean on is a common goal, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the true essence of community and coming together with different perspectives is so we could reach a common goal even through the arts, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Matt, I mean, a lot of these perspectives were so good. I mean, when we talk home and art, there were a lot of awesome perspectives shared for sure. Yeah, and I think the next step, I wanna ask one more question to at least one of the artists. Um, unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to hit every single person with, with each question because we'll just, we'll, we'll run out of time. But 
Um, I wanna ask one more question to the artists and then we'll expand out and, and start to fold in the, uh, our, the leaders of the various organizations. Um, David, I wanna ask this question to you. Have you ever felt at home working with an established mainstream arts institution or, or organization? You know, and if so, what worked for you and what could have been better? So this is more of a question of sort of feeling at home, actually working inside, collaborating with a mainstream arts uh, organization. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been able to, again, like I have a very unique perspective of being a native and then also to my work with institutions previously has been more from a media service perspective and not necessarily like a practicing artist. Um, so more of a contractor doing video work, photo work, things of that nature. Um, and to... You know, I've been blessed that a lot of that work has allowed for me to be more connected to my home. I'm, I'm uh, you know, having, um, you know, co-curated and doing an exhibition design for Welcome to Brooklyn at the Gantt, and then following that up with doing video work for the Home CLT exhibition at the Levine Museum of the New South. That allowed for me to learn more, um, more about my home than I had learned in growing up here, to be honest. Charlotte has a lot of hidden history, especially as it relates to people of color and Black people. A lot of um, things have been erased. A lot of things have been changed. A lot of buildings have been torn down, a lot of neighborhoods have been torn down. So working on those creative projects allow me a perspective to be able to see, um, you know, what my city was really founded on and city was really built on, especially as it being a black man and, um, you know, what, what, how black people pay such a pivotal role in building the city to be what it is, even though it's not something that's necessarily reflected in what we see in our kind of mainstream culture that Charlotte has currently. So for me, I felt at home because I was able to use those projects to be, to be able to get closely tied to, you know, the roots of, of, uh, of my hometown. Um, and I, again, like that's not a, 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 an experience that I can say that most people, you know, are, are given. So I'm, I'm blessed to have, to have had those experiences, but I also know that that's not the common experience for, you know, for my other, for other creatives and for black people across the city. Yeah. When you were, when you actually started to, to collaborate with Gantt or Levine, did you feel like as an artist stepping into those environments, you had to get your sea legs or did you just feel like a fish in water? Like you were off and running in it. You know, it was just another, it was just another space to do your work. No, nah, yeah, definitely, man. My, my experience ranges from a, a number of different things. And I, um, you know, what, the Whitaker group is, is one of the leading, um, you know, agencies and, and um, boutique retailers in the, in the country and really the world. So I'm used to working with brands like Nike, Adidas, Reebok, et cetera. Um, so I work on very large projects all of the time. So, I mean, it was really just it being in a new space. I think the biggest thing was just being able to get, uh, you know, some of our institutions to be able to see the opportunity and doing things a little bit different and how different elements of culture can tie together to create a bigger impact and really put Charlotte on a global scale as it relates to arts and culture. Um, there's a very traditional mindset as it relates to how we approach things from an institutional perspective. So, you know, for me, um, I was able to come in and I think be immediately effective provide value. Um, but I think that that might have been capped based off of um, just kind of like preconceived notions or how things were done previously, as opposed to being able to leverage some of my other experience and connections to get something done. Gotcha. Well, thank you for sharing that. As I think everyone on this uh, call would agree, it should always start with the art and the artist. And that's why we wanted to start our first couple of questions specifically to the artists in the show. But uh, hey, I think it's, it's a time to start to widen out the scope of the conversation and we'll start to uh, bring our organizations into it. Absolutely, friends. So while we were doing some digging for this um, amazing work that we're doing here on the Zoom, I ran across an awesome article from JSTOR and the title of it was How Black Artists Fought Exclusion in Museums, but really work focuses on representation properly of not just Black and Latinx artists, but every artist, truly the value in art, as Krista mentioned. Um, so I want to toss this question over, question over to Todd Smith. Um, Todd, real quick, so in the article, there was a cool quote I found. She said, how is it possible that a world-class art museum's exhibition about a community could neglect to include the art of that very community? So Todd Smith, I wanted to ask you, what's one major way that your organization and institution has created space for the conversation surrounding art, activism, and especially representation? Great. Well, thanks so much for, for that article. I had a chance to read it. And, and it, the article references a late 1960s show at the Met about, about art in Harlem, but it didn't have any African-American artist in the show. So that very egregious affront, I think, really sort of changed how many of us look at exhibitions. Yeah. Um, so at the Beckler, you know, our, our mandate is a little different than many of my, my colleagues on the panel. We, we are really about mid-century and, and early 
60s and 70s art for the most part um, from a European perspective. But we did just open a show um, titled One Cent Life, which is the um, looks at a portfolio by a, a Chinese artist who made his way from Shanghai to Paris and then New York and worked with a whole host of uh, artists in New York. And it's the first time the museum has really forefronted um, someone of a, a non-European background with a solo show. And then the next show we'll do is a survey of 20th century women in the museum's collection. Again, the first time we've really sort of put out there a reassessment of our collection from the point of view of gender. And the show really does have some powerhouses um, in terms of the work and, and as well as the artists. So, you know, we, we are moving forward. Um, I think we're probably the institution that will move forward probably the slowest in that we are historically bound by the collection. Um, and so, but that's not to say that those of us inside the institution, many of us who are brand new, come from perspectives where we have looked as academics and as historians around issues of race and gender and sexuality. So you'll see different programming coming out of the, of the Beckler going forward. No, absolutely, Todd. And I love that, you know, you spoke very candidly about how even with all of the restrictions, you all are still making headway. So that is definitely to be appreciated and definitely giving your flowers. Ali, I would like to turn this um, question over to you. Um, what is one way that, you know, your organization or institution has created space for conversations surrounding art and activism and representation? And I would love to hear your perspective. Sure. So um, first I'll say, I think artists provide so many opportunities for us to question our own and to lift up their lived experiences. And I think um, we need to continue to make space for that. Um, last year, McCall Center prototyped resident residency, which was um, specifically for five Charlotte-based artists who are working in social practice and want to give a shout out to Milan. In, um, who's here. Hey Milan, it's good to see you. Um, and this was really the first time we had a residency that was focused on local artists who are making change within their communities. And, you know, I'll be honest, it helped us to really shift in our thinking about how we support an open space and collaborate with local artists. And um, we had some learnings, you know, there were some really great things about it. And, you know, we had some missteps as an organization, but as a leader, it's really important that we continue to reevaluate those things and um, to make sure we're being honest with uh, moments that are not our finest. Yeah, no, absolutely, Ali. And there was something so good that you said was collaboration with local artists. I think a lot of times collaboration you know sometimes we see it in a grand scheme of things but really you know we have some of the best artists here in charlotte that are local and with those partnerships magic can truly happen so thank you for sharing your perspective ali um, i'm gonna toss it over to todd herman uh mr herman what is one way that your organization or institution has created space for conversations surrounding art activism and representation uh well the one thing that you can do and that we've done is you have to sort of empower your employees to and your staff to go out and do that, right? And let them know that from the top down that that is important because the, the staff takes their cue from the director or you know, from sort of the senior leadership team. And if you want staff to go out and really engage with the local artist community, you've got to empower them to do that and let them know that you are encouraging them to do that. So. Um, so I think we've been, um, you know, we've been doing that um, quite a bit, and I've made it clear to to my staff that one that a focus of the Mint Museum going forward is to really embrace the local artist community. And we've we've done, you know, a lot of different things, and um, I don't need to go through a whole laundry list. Um, I know Krista on here was uh, one of our Constellation CLT artists. Uh, D'Angelia is up right now, and I think. Milone, I think, are you next? No, are you maybe in January? But I know you're coming up. Okay, I know you're coming up, you're on the list. Um, and then of course, you know, the work that we did with Classic Black, which just got written up in the Wall Street Journal. And what's interesting there about Classic Black over at Randolph Road, and if you're not aware, or you haven't gone to see the show, it's, um, it's an exhibition about Josiah Wedgwood's black basalt sculpture. So it doesn't get more traditional than that, right? I mean, that is super traditional, 18th century, looking at classic prototypes. So what we did though, was we put it into an environment that was created 
by a local artist. And some of you know Owl of, of, of Owl and Arco. Uh, and she came in and created an entire environment for those sculptures. And it completely transformed the whole experience. The Wall Street Journal came down, wrote a glowing article um, and other, uh, you know, other uh, museum people have come through and have been just uh, really not so much surprised. I, I mean, I'll just use this term blown away by the way that such traditional material has been seamlessly uh, enlivened through this contemporary artist context. So there, there are ways to make this work in a really successful way. Um, and I think it, it's just, it, um, it just adds so much to our experience uh, when we can, when we can um, bring contemporary artists into the conversation. Uh, so that's, I, I think that that's really, really important. And we also had that happening at Randolph Road in our Art of the Ancient Americas collection where we have a contemporary artist sort of riffing on those earlier works and the work is sort of placed uh, in and throughout those collections. So it's, it's something we believe in and are doubling down on going forward. Absolutely, Todd. And you know, you, you offer an amazing perspective in regards to the arts, right? And how sometimes art speaks the words that we don't have, but it gives others and different communities experiences. So that's, that's really cool. Um, Amy, I'm gonna toss it over to you. What's a way that an organization and institution has created space for conversations surrounding art, activism, and representation. So I, I think it's important to just like recognize that Goodyear Arts is really different than any of the other organizations represented here. One, we're not an institution. We are artist run and artist founded. Um, th that's really core to our values and to our mission. Um, also, we only really primarily support local artists. Um, <clears throat> our entire residency program is local artists. Um, you have to live like within 30 miles of the spot that we're currently at. Um, so I don't know, we don't, we don't support non-local artists. So it's hard for me to reflect on how we do support local artists because literally everything that we do is supporting local artists. Um, there's sort of like a second question there, which is like, how are we supporting arts activism? And I think that arts activism is a really uh, tricky thing. And I think that not, I don't think that most art is activism. I think all art is active and that people can certainly be inspired by art and and that some art is activism, but I think that for the most part, art is active, not activism. And I think that there's a little bit of conflation between those two terms. Goodyear Arts supports artists in whatever they want to do. Um, we're extremely open. We don't censor. We don't try to change what an artist's vision is. Um, and so if an artist comes to us with an idea of something that they would like to do, we kind of let them go full force. To me, that's sort of like the most powerful thing that can be handed to an artist is sort of like the keys to the, to the space, um, which we do quite often. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I, I don't, I guess I don't really know how to reflect on like how we're supporting how, how we're supporting just this community versus outside of this community. The entirety of Goodyear Arts was formed because we kind of saw this gap that local artists weren't being supported in the way that they needed to be. And we wanted to sort of try to fill that hole. Um, you know, Stacy is one of our alum and um, maybe he can speak to it also. Yeah, no, no, no. And thank you for sharing your perspective. What I love about Goodyear is it's for the artists and by the artists. Truly like supporting local artists for sure. Uh, Stacey, I saw that you unmuted. I would like for you to sound off too to offer some more perspective. Yeah, I, I, would, definitely, um, I, I would definitely say that Goodyear definitely provided not only just the platform, but the space um, and resources um, for artists um, who are part of the collective, who are part of the residency. To, to do their work. They don't censor any type of, um, they don't censor your work um, and they're there to uh, be supportive. So, you know, 
I think Amy, I think when uh, the question was asked and, and you brought up Goodyear, um, Goodyear does that you definitely support local artists um, and it is run by artists. So they know what the need is. And, um, you know, I, one of the things I will always say about Goodyear is like, you know, like any good business, they, they found a gap and they filled it, you know, by, um, by realizing that local artists needed not only a place to show their work, to collaborate, but also a space, just a space to create work. Yeah. Um, because a lot of times you would talk to people who come to Charlotte asking, you know, where are all the artists at? And there's not one defined place where you can find local artists. At one point you would say South End, at one point you would say no to, and some people would say, um, um, uh, um, you know, Areas, but you know, Goodyear kind of provided that place where you knew to go, where to go to see local artists, to see them not only their work on display, but creating work in the process. And 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 so much of what we do is in the process. So. Yeah, no, absolutely, Stacy, and I could appreciate that. And you said something so good, especially when people ask about where's the artist at. They also ask where's the space, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah. That's always been a thing. It's like, okay, well, where are these spaces where we can create and turn it into something? So I definitely. I really appreciate that perspective a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Alexis, I would love for you to chime in. Um, I know Alexis very well, very, very awesome. She's helped me even to engage with the Gantt and I really wanted her to sound off on this. With your experience at the Gantt, Alexis, how have you seen where, you know, you've seen space created for conversations surrounding art and activism and representation? That's what we do at the Gantt Center. It's really about creating this space, right? Our mission is about um, really celebrating the art history and culture of African Americans and those of African descent. So that is where we have this home and this space for those people who are underrepresented. Yeah. Um, me, I have an art history degree and kidding my degree in art history, there was often this big gap of where are the artists that look like me? Where are the images that look like me? And so being able to have that space cater to that um, is, is very important for representation. Um, at the Gantt Center, we often look at artist activism. Um, because a lot of times throughout history, Black artists have used that tool as creating some type of form of message or things that just feel like their voice wasn't heard, so art was a way to do it. And so at the Gantt Center, we've been doing that. We had an actual theme as artist activism in 2015 and 2016. Um, we also launched a lot of careers. Um, we provide a platform for emerging artists. Um, behind me is actually an image of Marcus Kaiser and Jason Woodbury. That's a prime example of how they use their tool as artist activism. I'm using it in a very digestible way of looking at social issues, but they're Charlotte artists too. Um, Dave Butler will talk about that later, being able to bring Dave and Alvin C. Jacobs, Charlotte um, really represent representation inside of the museum wall. So we're looking at representation on a level of um, African-American artists, Black artists, and also on a local level. Again, how can we break down those walls? And the Gantt Center does that through their art. And a big part of that is the conversations we have. Oh, Havia, you hosted a couple of conversations um, online virtual, but we also had conversations in per person before COVID as well, mm -hmm. to be able to digest and really look at how art can start this conversation for so much more and also make action for change as well. So that's what we do at the Gantt Center and we've been doing it since 1974. And when we moved to the Gantt space that we are in now in 2009. Yeah, 100% Alexis. And you know, there's something that you said that was so good is art speaks the words, right? Sometimes that we don't have, and it really is active. Art can be active for sure. So Matt, here we are, we talked, we spoke a little bit to um, a lot of these amazing people about how they can, you know, support artists and also like what their organizations and institutions institutions is doing to like really let artists just be right so let's talk a little bit about activism in itself Matt right I would love to hear more about that and how the public can even support in that activism you know interestingly enough Dave uh David you had mentioned earlier your your show Welcome to Brook Hill uh that was in uh, at the Gantt and I'd like to touch on that for a moment um I think of the impact of that show uh, that, that that show had in creating dialogue around the community and its changes and so I'd love to hear from you and, answer, and from others as well. In what ways can artists use their gifts to bring attention to important issues such as gentrification, et cetera? It feels like a kind of an offshoot to the art as activism conversation, but it just feels like a great place to land right now. So could you talk a little bit about how you feel artists can use their gifts to bring attention to these really, really critical issues in our community? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and I first, I just want to start by, you know, if we're talking about Welcome to Brookhill, giving a shout out to Alvin C. Jacob Jr., who was the um, 
artists in residence at the Gantt who put together that entire exhibition. Um, all of those photos were taken by Alvin. And um, I was brought in to, like I said, do the exhibition design. And then I added some like uh, additional graphic elements and kind of helped with some of the wall vinyls and things like that and handled the exhibition design. But um, in terms of artists being able to use their gift, uh, I think it's very, very important if that's what you feel called for it to, for it to be, right? Like everybody has to know their purpose and you can just because you're a black and you're an artist doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be an activist, right? Um, I think it's very important to make that distinction that your art is yours and you you have the ability to do what do with it what you want. Um, should you decide to to be someone who is an image activist, you must understand that you're walking the tradition of folks who have done it before you, folks who have, um, you know, folks who have you know laid a lot on the line and sacrificed a lot um, in order to uh, be able to tell these stories and provide visuals and um, documentation for a lot of these instances and occurrences across history. Um, so you should know that you're not alone. And you should know that it's a rich tradition attached to it. Um, and, you know, it's going to be very important moving forward. Like if you think about um, everything that we've experienced as a nation, looking at the past few months um, outside of COVID, just with the, with the spike in interest in the Black Lives Matter movement and all that, you know, we have a whole new generation of photographers um, and videographers and designers and painters who are, who, have, who played a, an amazing role um, and making sure that those moments were documented and making sure that there was more than one narrative being told and using their power via social media. Um, so as history is unfolding, we now have an opportunity via technology to be able to, um, you know, create our own history books as opposed to dealing with the ones that, are, that were, you know, presented in a lot of the classrooms that we were given. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Dave, for that perspective. And Alexis, I want to go back to you because I, I know you want to, I'm sure you want to jump in on this question about Brook Hill since it was at your home uh, at the Gantt. Um, absolutely. The idea of Welcome to Brookhill started around about a year and a half, two years before it even launched. Um, it was an internal discussion and through a lot of going through different things about which neighborhoods we should do. The best thing we did was invite Alvin C. Jacobs to join the conversation and to be able to bring that vision to life. And through Alvin, he was able to then bring in Dave. And that's the importance, again, looking at the community because it gets introduced to so many different incredible artists. Um, the biggest thing with Welcome to Book Brook Hill, though, I really want to make it clear, is that that whole exhibition was, of course, a teamwork collaborative effort. However, it included all Charlotte artists when you walk through that, when you walk through the door. Alvin C. Jacobs was the photographer. Dave did the design and element to help curate the show. Uh, we were there up late trying to choose the images as well. I know Dave, you remember that um, in there too, however long it took to make sure the show not only looked good visibly, but also brought in the community to make, their, that, make sure that their perspective was at the forefront. When you walked in, you heard music as well. That was three local Charlotte artists. Um, that was a suggestion by Dave and Alvin. All the educational component was done um, by James Ford. And at the great time, we had an amazing opportunity to bring Angie Chandler, who was really over the education and programs during that time to really tie in those educational elements and making sure that our program was also done inside of the museum walls, but outside of it as well, to bring the community in, to do programs at Brook Hill Village. Um, we also had a design by Marcus Kaiser um, that who helped the design and the videographer who did it was at that time a Charlotte-based artist. So the importance of using that community to then tell the story and to be able to talk about the topic, yes, was gentrification, but how can you go deeper than that? To make sure that we humanize that term, to make sure that we understand that the community needs to be put first. Too often we kind of forget about the community and the people behind those terms like gentrification or urban renewal, or we need to make the city more pretty and beautiful. There are people behind that, and that's the power of art and the power of the community, the people who've been on the ground, and to be able to uh, really put forth uh, that in a, in a museum space is incredible, and not to forget, we need to break down our museum walls to make sure that we're out in the community, which that's why we did a lot of program in Brook Hill Village and other areas as well. Thank you, Matt. Absolutely. Thank you, Alexis. I want to circle over to Krista again. Krista, I love your perspective on this idea of of the role that art plays in activism. And, and do you think the public understands that role? Or is that some is that sort of a secret secret weapon that's happening behind the scenes? What's your what's your thoughts on this topic? I think it's less of a secret weapon now that um, visual metaphor has become such a strong symbol within social media. So it catches fire a lot faster. And once an image gets into your head, it it bounces around. 
for a very long time. For instance, Stacey Utley's piece in the gallery where a big white spill of paint is covering a black neighborhood. That's a visual metaphor. I will never forget that, you know, and and when Chanupa, Chanupa, sorry, sorry, Sonia and Milan, I'm happy that they brought him to Charlotte. He came up and said, art is a verb. You couldn't have said anything better to me, you know, and, and really when art is out there in the world, and I think Alexis just brought that up too, when those walls are more aerated and the doors are open and you're outside of the walls and you're out there in the community, it becomes a much different thing. I think also organizations and artists all have their missions and their missions need to be aerated too, okay? So I think missions need to have a place to encompass what's happening right now. You know, right now, you know, we have an end date for our environment. We have a very big end date. That's kind of in the background. Everybody's ignoring it. It's this carbon noise back there, but you know what? How can I put that with this social justice issue? Well, I better figure out how to do that because that's part of my job. Absolutely, yeah. thank you so much, Krista. Ohavia, let's, I'm gonna to toss it back to you to sort of you know, sink our teeth into our next uh, question. Yes, indeed. So Krista made a really good point of like, we gotta figure it out, right? And I love that because it shows that we do work better together and also in collaboration. So I wanna toss it back over um, to our organizations really to really ask this. And um, I'm gonna start with you, Todd Smith. Um, if, okay, so when we talk the Bethler, right? Has it taken a while for cultural institutions to embrace artists of color when we talk the Beckler um, and non-traditional art activists? And what are the worries on your side? So have you seen where there was a, a, a feeling of a sense of hesitation? And if so, why? And what was the worries coming from the Beckler? Just to offer some perspective. Well, as many of you might know, I'm only two months into the job at the Beckler. So I don't want to speak for the for the history of, of the organization. Um, I think as we have done an, an excellent job and many of my colleagues are on this call um, in the last 10 years of reaching out to the community, not necessarily just with the exhibitions, but through all our access programs around the community. Um, I think the Beckler has done an extremely um, strong job of being in the community for a brand new institution whose mission wasn't given at the outset to be in the community so aggressively. So I, I, I applaud where we are. Um, and as we look forward to the next decade, looking again as to how we become um, broader based in what we do and who we include and who's around the table. And I think every institution, this might sound a little bit like a cliche, but every institution has to start where it is. And some are much further along in the conversations than others. And some will get further along than others. Um, I don't think we can all be judged by the same uh, set of criteria. No, 100% Todd. And you said something so good, I, I had to take it as a note is, uh, expand a broader base and recognize who's at the table. So truly no, and also, uh, congratulations, two months in and you're doing good work. So why not? But no, very true. You spoke to something that's real and it's recognizing who's around the table, but especially who isn't. Um, and Amy, I want to toss this to you. So what I love about Goodyear is it truly is the model of for artists by artists. Um, how have y'all managed to stick to that, right? So for the artist by the artist, um, how have you all really continued to offer that opportunity for local artists and keep it going for all of the years that you all have? Speak to me. Um, well, I think like we, there was a little bit of talk about like mission and making sure that you're able to air out your mission. And we do that often. And our mission is very simple. And it's just based on the fact that artists need time, space, money, and community. Um, I don't think that that will ever change the fact that artists need those things. Um, so it kind of makes our mission statement and like our job to try to get those things for artists like pretty straightforward. Um, in terms of how we continue to do that, that's a little bit more challenging. Um, we have pretty aggressively gone after every grant that we see. Um, we are primarily grant funded. Uh, we don't have sort of the same sort of cushy uh, donor base that some of the other organizations have. We're working with a much smaller budget. 
overall, but we like to think that we really make our, our dollars stretch. Um, we, uh, you know, are just really fortunate to have received some really impactful grants over the last couple of years. We're hopeful that we can continue to do so. We're also super, super thankful and couldn't make this work at all without donated space. Um, we're currently in our third donated space, which we have because we asked for it. Um, and I think that had we not, you know, just asked, then we probably wouldn't be in the position that we're in. And I think that a lot of what Goodyear does is based on just artists asking us for, th for things or to do things or to kind of have an opportunity. We're like super open, maybe not as much during COVID, but um, like every time an artist kind of asks to do something, if it's feasible, possible, if it supports the mission, we try to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. If it supports the mission, very good. But also, uh, I, I'm so glad that you pointed to like grants and funding and all that. And even how you know explained it, how it's different for Goodyear versus the other organizations. Um, shout out to all the people who pull up for you, especially because it, it is different. Um, and keeping that in mind, all the folks watching Goodyear is much different. But at the end of the day, people continue to pull up. So Amy, thank you for that. Um, Ali, I would really like to have your perspective on well um how have you know where you worked your organization the institution um how have you all embraced artists of color and non-traditional art activists are there any worries on your side and if so what are those i would really love your perspective sure well we've always taken a stance that um artists need to have um the ability to have unvarnished opportunities to speak um, they need to have their voice um, and we've sided, you know, with artists when issues have come to be and to Amy's point, you know, our organization and almost everyone here is um, one that's built on philanthropy and philanthropy is um, built on dominant white culture and we've got to start to break down philanthropy. Um, how we value people, you know, that's typically through money. Um, and um, how we as leaders make decisions that are in the best interest of our organization. It can't always come down to money. So, you know, we've had friction in the past with donors coming in saying they didn't like something. And, you know, ultimately it's our job to stand behind the artist and to give them that platform and that opportunity to speak. So um, it's so complex, this entire system, but I think leaders, you know, we all in the seats, uh, all the people here that are leading organizations, we have the responsibility to step forward and um, to push back because if we don't disassemble this structure, um, we're not going to make any progress. Yes. Come on, Allie. Yes, I almost threw my laptop. I'm gonna toss it over to you, Todd Herman. <laughs> Cause listen, this is what this is about friends, literally breaking fourth wall here, but this is what this is about is having the honest to progress, right? To make progress, not only in art, but also give an artist the opportunity to let their voice be heard. So Ali, I so appreciated that response for real. Uh, Todd Herman, I wanted to ask you, um, how has your institution and organization embraced artists of color and non-traditional art activists? And have you seen any worries, friction, frustration on your end? Uh, um, you know, I don't think that I've seen or heard of any frictions per se. I mean, maybe Maybe they're there and 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 they haven't they haven't come to me, but um, I do feel as though I've been um, as I mentioned before, I've been just encouraging the staff to really reach out. And of course, the Mint has had um, an outreach department for a long time, and some of you might know Ruby Britt Height, who's been at the museum for a long time um, in our outreach department. Um, working with Greer Heights, working with our Mint to Move program, working with bilingual story time. I mean, there are just a number of things uh, that the Mint has been doing that maybe some people just aren't aware of um, because it's sort of targeted to, um, you know, different groups who, who really love those programs, um, but it might not be uh, more widely more widely known. But um, I think, I'm sorry, I was, I was like answering so many things over in the chat. Um, but <laughs> Oh, sort I saw of you too, Todd. Public, I saw public you. Public and private. I'm over here. I'm trying to listen <laughs> and I'm like typing away. Um, but um, I, you know, it's it's just we need as as an institution, at least this is my philosophy for the men, is we need to really understand and evaluate what it means to be a museum in a community, Ooh. right? So what does that mean? I mean, you know, like 
like, are, are we there, you know, are we there to be, to like get accolades from the people, you know, from somebody in London? No, that'd be right. great, but no, that's not what we're there for. We're there because we have people in our own community. We have artists in our community. And what I've, what I've said over and over to, um, to our staff and our board and others is one of the, one of the reasons that, that, Charlotte has a Mint Museum is because the community wanted it, right? The reason the Mint has a collection, I mean, with all of its, with all of its issues that come with collections, is because people believed that there was a reason to have a museum. So, so the Mint Museum is community-based and it is for the community, right? We wouldn't have the collection if community people didn't step forward and give. And so that collection then needs to give back to the community in ways where um, we can have dialogues like this about why the collection looks the way it does. Yeah. How was it built? What are the positive and of course the negatives to how that collection was put together, right? So we can talk about what does art mean and why do people have art and why do people give art and how is it useful? Um, what are its purposes? Um, and also for our local artists that we can be um, a place where, um, our local artist community can come and um, either riff off what's in the in in the collection. They can respond to it. They can learn from it. They can, you know, we're there to help support our local artist community. Absolutely. Right. Period. So we have we have a different role than say Sonia, who's there for you know who has who runs a commercial gallery. We are a nonprofit, but so we are there. But we are there to support our local artists, because if we don't do it, and I'm kind of speaking as sort of like the universal we here of the artist ecosystem, if we're not doing it for the, for the artists in our region, there isn't anybody else who's, who's doing it. So that is, that is one of our roles. It's, I, I think that the idea or the definition of a museum as a place where you sort of collect, store, present, and research a collection period stop is over. I mean, that's kind of a dinosaur, right? So we have to be these kind of porous spaces, um, not just porous for people coming in and out, but porous for ideas flowing in and out of, in and out of our brick and mortar. Because someone mentioned earlier in the conversation something about it's about people, and it absolutely is. And I say to our staff all the time, I remind them that when someone says, oh, the Mint did this or the Mint did that, I said, you need to remember the Mint is bricks and mortar. The Mint can't do anything, right? I mean, it is just a building. It's the people in the building. We are the ones that, that can make things happen or we are the ones that are at fault if something doesn't happen. Yeah. So the, the building itself is, is it's just a vessel, right? It, it is about us. And, and the staff needs to get out, they need to get known, seen, because it's, it's really that relationship with the staff and the people in the building that is the one that forms long-term um, connections within the community. No, 100%, Todd. And you said something so good as being a vessel, even as a brick and mortar. So would you say that you all have seen a healthy representation at the Mint? Would you say that? Or is there a way that um, that can be done? Can, can you repeat that? I was reading one of the chats. So. No, let me tell you, Todd, you in that chat, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I just see them fingers going. No, I wanted to say, like, being used as a vessel, would you say yeah. that you've seen representation at the Mint, truly? Like, have you seen that grow? Have you seen it graduate at all? Um, of artists from diff different backgrounds and perspectives and all the things. Yeah, I, th I think so. Um, um, I, I really do. I, I think we're seeing more and more... Um, Folks um, engage with the artwork in different ways, and, and we're we're promoting that. You know, we're we're encouraging people to come in and respond uh, to the work in with their own voice, right? okay. because that's that's what's so important, and that's why art art is activism just by its very nature, right? Because the artist the artist is producing something which is many times. A reflection of their own experiences, right? And what and, and the narrative that they're trying to sort of put forth to the public to say, 
here's what I'm feeling. Here's my reaction to this. Here's, you know, and that is, that is a form of activism because you're teaching somebody else about a point of view that maybe they're not familiar with. Yeah. So in and of itself, just having a collection, which is a, a museum, you know, is, is a collection. Having a collection of different voices is activism. I mean, because you, you're being exposed to different narratives and different points of view that are causing you to think outside of sort of your own sort of linear way of, of thinking. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. No, I appreciate you for sharing, Todd. And literally, friends, that's what it's all about is having this honest discussion to see what is represented and what isn't and how we can progress together. We do better when we collaborate collaborate and come together. Honestly, Matt, I'm excited. I saw a lot of the questions um, come up in the chat and I think it's some Q and A time because it gets good. It gets real good. I couldn't agree more. It definitely gets good. The first thing I wanna do actually is I wanna go circle back to the artists. We had a question come in that basically said they wanna hear the artists talk about their work in the show. We to do that anyway, but I think now is the perfect time to sort of circle back to our theme of home. And let's start with Stacy. And then we'll just hit each, all three of our artists. But Stacy, uh, talk to us a little bit about um, how, what you did to interpret home uh, in the show at, at Elder Gallery. Okay, sure. Um, so for me, home, um, this show for me was like a culmination of a lot of things kind of coming together all at once. Um, it was me um, looking back at my experience as an architect that influenced that training as an architect how did that um, impact home? Not only my home, but other, other homes, um, you know, as you're designing and, and working in the community. Um, and I wanted to use that training as an architect uh, to translate into painting. Um, a lot of times when you're doing architecture designs, you're creating this figure and you're putting this figure in a space that you kind of create. Well, what happens if that space is uh, taken away from you? What happens if that space of home is jeopardized? what happened if you are violated in that space. And so I wanted to activate that figure um, in the paintings to address things that we have all kind of been seen and bear witness, witness, witness to uh, for many of us for a long time, most of our lives, but a lot of times I think with COVID, we're forced, forced to kind of sit at home and actually really see how this country is. And so that, that's where the paintings kind of came from. Um, for those who were at the show, they saw the affordable houses pieces, which were small, four by four squares with these monopoly houses. Um, when I was in grad school, I, my thesis was focused on art at the intersection of gentrification and how artists find themselves um, in, in these communities, um, being a part of these communities, but at the same time seeing these communities change um, and wondering, you know, are they, are they helping the process for change? Or are they helping um, kind of, uh, are they trying to help uh, tell the story, the identity of that community? And so those particular pieces, each one of those are telling the story of gentrification from the beginning when you start getting letters and you start, um, well, not even before that, before when you're talking about urban planning and a 20 year plan and uh, redlining to when all of a sudden you start to get letters and offers for your houses. Um, and then when that house that you knew next door, the people next door all of a sudden was taken away from you. Um, this Something that I had been working on for several years. I worked on it in grad school. Um, I did it at good year during the residency, and it kind of culminated in these smaller pieces here, um, where it's just kind of telling that narrative from beginning to end of gentrification, from the beginning where you you know your your property is not seen as valuable to the end where you're forced out of your property because somebody else sees the value of it. Um, and so it's really kind of just talking that whole process of gentrification. It, they are incredibly powerful contributions to this to that show. Incredibly strong, powerful pieces. I was there at the uh, opening night, and I just saw people gravitating toward them, really pulled in to the narrative that was being shared through those pieces. And and then I circled back another day. Uh, the gallery was it was during the middle of the day, so we were there. Tim and I were there to do like a quick WBTV thing, so no one was there, and it was like a totally different experience. The gravitational pull of the pieces was still as strong, but now I was there by myself and I got to sort of, you know, compare what it was like to see your pieces among other people and then there by myself. It was really, really powerful. So thanks for uh, sharing that perspective with us. No, thank um, you. Krista, I'd love to hear your thoughts. What did you do to bring your, interpret that theme of home uh, in the show at Elder Gallery? Well, you know, home for me has always been people. So, and, and the 
environment. So, um, you know, I really enjoy changing the paradigm of the distanced audience. Okay. And I always like to be out of the white box. So, of course, I did an earthwork outside um, and it did get hit pretty hard by one of our climate change little uh, squalls that happened the other day. Um, I remember. But, you know, when I'm talking about, um, you know, loss of habitat for all these species and all these things that are around us that we're pay not paying attention to, that loss of habitat relates directly to what Stacy is doing. I mean, there's people down the road. I mean, the Brook Hill project is on this like really weird thread down the road of, ooh, is Charlotte actually gonna stand behind some affordable housing? You know, that's an embarrassment for us. Maybe we should, right? Um, so it was important for me in my Overlook piece, which was the piece that took me so much time with all the hands and then the species raining down. It was really important for me to tie in the whole idea of the environment is truly at risk and we're part of that system. And our neighborhoods are at risk too. And our whole city is really at risk. If some of us are having issues, that means all of us are having issues. So it's really about changing the whole system. And those systems are interwoven. You can't separate them. We keep thinking that they're separate and they're not. So when I was having a conversation with a friend of mine that's part of an extinction rebellion group, he's telling me about how um, they, they changed their mission right away to include to be inclusive of social justice. And so I felt like it was really important to put, you know, some Jonathan Farrell in my piece and some Black Lives Matter Black protesters that get arrested way more than the white protesters right next to the crawfish and the salamanders and, and all those other things that we're losing. And, you know, actually we're losing a lot. <laughs> right now it's all closer to a hundred. We've lost a million of our nine million species in the past 10 years. So as a Gen Xer, who's friends with a lot of baby boomers, it's really important to hold myself responsible for the environment and for social justice together. Yeah, well, you know, when we, I, we ran into you and you were working on the piece post, post flash flood and uh, sort of bringing everything you're saying to life, like in real time and then to go inside and see that like for example that powerful hands piece i mean just just incredible work so thank you for that perspective and for your work in this show um david same question to you can you tell us a little bit about your interpretation of the theme of poem uh, for this show yeah newly um so all of the photography work that's displayed in the show was either shot on 35 millimeter disposable film or polaroid film um, and kind of display via these puzzle pieces in order to um, kind of talk about just how uh, life in and of itself is a puzzle and you're constantly changing your perspective and finding different pieces to put it together. Um, the images themselves are from an archive of about really this entire time of me building my art practice and trying to figure it out. Um, the last six years since I really came home from college and just was navigating the world, left corporate America, started working retail and started really leaning on my creative um, abilities to be able to make a living for myself. So really this, this archive of work is, you know, was, you know I mean? My, my, my documentation of what my home might've been. Some nights it might've been a couch, you know what I'm saying? Couch surfing at a, at a concert, trying to shoot some photos or something like that. It might've just been, you know, going out to eat with the homies. Um, and then when it came down to synthesizing it for the show, um, I kind of can't land it on three main themes and, um, it was either what was life like growing up in Charlotte, what was life like growing up in the South, um, or, you know, what are the things that I would want to be a part of my home as I look to, like, you know, establish a family and things like that. I'll be turning 30 next year. So, you know, you start thinking about all those types of things, I guess, leaving your 20s. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was really about those three categories and just, like, you know, how can I give a visual experience? I was never one who really liked to mat and just frame photos and put them up on the wall. I needed to add another layer of context to make the images just innately and inherently interesting. I always felt like photography that's displayed in like museums or galleries is normally, um, there's always like a layer of context that makes it like, you know, it's extremely provocative. It's either like nudity or it has some type of historical context to it that makes it super important or just something very, very like jarring. And if it wasn't that, then it wasn't just like inherently interesting. So I, I wanted to find a way 
to, um, you know, like I said, make the, make the, give the visual experience and we'll let that visual experience be as in instinctive in interpreting it as it is for me shooting it, right? Like taking a Polaroid image or a disposable image is something that everybody has the ability to do. Um, and it's a very quick and instinctual um, portion of photography. Um, unlike the kind of very technical aspects that I've like trained myself in over the years, you know, working with DSLR. So, um, you know, this, this show is really, um, it's my first commercial show, which I'm excited about. And it's my first crossover and from going into, like I said, doing more, um, you know, creative services work within the arts field to being able to establish myself as an artist and have a, a route for my practice. So I'm super thankful for Sonia giving me this opportunity and um, I'm looking forward to being able to create more work you know, continue to run with this puzzle concept. And uh, yeah. Well, thank you for that, David. And, and, you know, when I walked into opening night, the second I walked in, I saw one of the puzzle pieces. And the first thing I thought was, that's Dave. Like that, that is a, that is an undeniable butler right there. I knew it was you. And then I saw you there. And then I went up and saw the placard and I thought I was right. It was, it's a beautiful piece, a great collection. And uh, so thanks for that perspective on that. Um, Ohavia, I know we have some other questions that have come in. Do you want to tee yeah. up one? Absolutely. I got you. So I have been stalking this chat and these questions, when I tell you, Matt, they are coming in and coming in. Okay. So the first one that I found, um, and honestly, if I miss any of y'all's questions, please just like copy and paste and put them in there and we'll get them answered for sure. Um, but this was a really good one, Matt. It says, activist art tends to occupy and repurpose urban spaces made and designed by others and for other purposes. Does anyone have thoughts about expanding collaboration between artists and the urban designer slash architects who are the creative makers of these spaces? That was deep. Um, let's start with you, Allie. <laughs> Allie, is there, do you have any thoughts about expanding collaboration between artists and the urban designers, architects who are the creative makers of these spaces? Uh, what are some ways that you can see that that can happen? Uh, well, I think first, um, artists have to be at the table. They've got to be valued um, and put on the same plane as urban designers. And, you know, I also think um, when we're talking about these um, sessions where, you know, urban de designers gather feedback, there need to be different ways to do that to make people feel welcome. And I'll share something in the chat with you all this great designer that has made opportunities like that possible. But yeah, absolutely. I think um, we as arts organizations, you know, centered in a place have to rethink um, our role and the places we occupy. And something we're working on right now is um, in talking with Mecklenburg County about um, being able to possibly use some of their underutilized spaces in Uptown Charlotte for local artists and arts organizations. So I think, you know, the repurpose concept is important, but we also need to make sure artists are involved on the front end of those conversations. Yes, 100% Ali, we love to see it and hear it. Todd Smith, I wanted to ask you, does, do you have any thoughts about expanding collaboration between artists um, and urban designers, uh, particularly for the Beckler? Um, how would that look? And how can we make the collaboration with a lot of these creative makers in these spaces? Right, so one of the things we're talking about internally is how we, how we deal with the questions of design. And for us, a little more historic, a little bit more object-based at the moment, but expanding that conversation. And I think it's at that point, that we can open up our conversations to a broader public, whether it's architects, designers, um, or those artists who work from a position of, of, of object as well as two-dimensional and really you know, sort of make the conversation more about the role of design in our overall lives, um, still based on the historical collection that we have and the historical reference that we can make. And I think that's, that's really our role is making sure that the underpinnings of modernism are understood and that they really do provide, as Todd, my colleague also said, that they provide a place for, for working artists to, to reject, react, embellish, and draw upon. And I think that's a very important role for, for our museum in this community, especially for living and working artists. No, absolutely. It's creating that space for all the things to happen we love to hear it Todd Herman only because Todd passed it to you so I got to pass it to the Todd's <laughs> but Todd how do you feel like the mint uh, what are your thoughts on expanding collaboration between artists and urban designers and architects to really make change like with the creative makers in a lot of these spaces yeah um, I, I agree 100% with 
uh, what Ali said about having, you know, artists at the table during the design process. I mean, too many times, I think, um, you know, they're sort of brought in at the end, sort of like, oh, okay, well, you know, we've got this space over here, you know, why don't we bring an artist in to create something for the, the space? When, if they had been there from the beginning, they could have really helped to develop the space in a way where the art works in collaboration and isn't just additive. Yeah. Right? Because one thing we know about, about artists is they have a wonderful sense of how, of space relations, how people respond to visual, to visual cues. I know uh, Krista was talking about that earlier in one of her comments. Um, so bringing artists in, I mean, to be quite honest, even if you are not creating a work of art, bringing artists in to uh, give input yeah. in a design or an architecture because, architecture because of their capacity to um, understand sort of spatial dimensions and how people respond to what they're seeing in spaces that they're in, I think adds so much to kind of the, the final product. Um, and I think too many times it's just simple, you know, doors, windows, ceiling, floor, walls, you know, done, call it a day. Um, that we need those spaces to be more, more dynamic and more responsive to the people who are in them. Because after all, we spend, we spend half of our lives inside of a space, right? Yeah. So they, they should be, they should be compatible to us in some way, respond to us in a way that makes us feel good, positive, empowered. Um, but we do sell it short uh, too often. I will put in a plug. <laughs> if you come to Mint Museum Uptown, you can see Foragers, which is the artist piece which is put on our 96 windows in the atrium. So it is floor to ceiling, it's 60 feet by 40 feet. Um, of a work celebrating uh, roles of women where the artist has actually taken, um, been inspired by scenes from uh, works from art history where men are shown as sort of the, the makers, doers, laborers, and she's sort of turned that to it being the women who are actually making the things happen and doing these things as we know they did in history, although it was the men who were shown doing them, right? right? Um, and so she sort of flips that on its head and it's a huge, huge, it's almost like a giant piece of stained glass. Mm -hmm. And what's great about that artist architecture collaboration is when the sun shines through, those colors are on the wall, they're on the floor, they're on you. So that work of art actually literally does kind of surround you and land on you as a viewer. And that is a great, great, experience. Yeah. No, 100% Todd. And literally it goes back to offering different perspectives for otherwise what we've usually seen. Amy, I wanted to ask you this also because part of that question actually inspired the question that I have for you. When we think creative makers for artists, that's what Goodyear stands on, right? Be in that space where artists can create out of, work out of. So Amy, I wanted to ask, how do you continue to foster that environment where it is for local artists, by local artists, and continue to give, basically give them that platform to give them the support that they need? I mean, it's kind of the same answer as the last one, you know, like we just really do everything that we can to try to expand our reach. Um, you know, it's not, it's, it's not, um, it's not like it's point A to point B sometimes it's, it's like a much more circular conversation. We have a collective of over 30 artists at this point that all kind of give their ideas and their thoughts and how can we continue to grow and continue to make it better? Um, I would like to say that in terms of the last question, the um, sort of like how can we incorporate art into sort of like public space or how can artists and uh, sort of like placemaking go more hand in hand? Um, I, I do think Goodyear is actually a really excellent example of that. Um, we've sort of just taken over these buildings um, and made them into something they weren't prior. They were sort of empty, derelict. I realize it's sort of working backwards, um, but like, especially at our first building where we had the opportunity to alter the building um, because we knew that it was gonna be torn down. 
each one of the 12 artists and residents were tasked with changing the building in some meaningful way and leaving their mark. Um, and so when the building was torn down, so were those 12 pieces of art. And so we sort of gave it like a, this beautiful like Viking funeral where we sent it, sent the building off with sort of some love. Um, but in ter I don't know, in terms of like, how do we continue to grow and offer more opportunities? I think it's just like listening. Yeah. Um, and I think that's such a big thing right now is just like, you have to listen. You don't know everything. We don't know everything. I don't know anything. Yeah. Um, so it's just, just like always listening to the people who know more than you, who know better than you, who <clears throat> know different things than you, um, and trying to continue to grow and having open conversations. Absolutely. And you better talk that talk. It's about listening, literally leaving the space to listen. A lot of times we, we speak and we want to offer like so many perspectives, but sometimes the answer's right in front of us. All we got to do is listen. Matt, I'm telling you, I don't, come on, Matt, these questions, Matt, did I miss one? Matt, what else we got? Well, it's hard to keep up with them because they keep rolling in, but I did catch something. I'm surprised my, my 47 year old brain at 752 what? actually caught this, but I did. There's an audience question that came in uh, that said, uh, this is from Daily that said, where does black and brown leadership within your organizations play into this conversation? That yeah. actually aligns with a panelist question that was submitted, submitted to us uh, this week, you know, prior to this event. And that question was, a lot of institutions don't have a problem reaching out to artists of color when it comes to putting uh, together a show that surrounds a topic. However, we as artists of color don't always see ourselves reflected in the body of those institutions from staff to vendors, et cetera. So what steps or, or conversations have these organizations taken to better reflect the, uh, you know, the community, the patrons from various Charlotte communities? I think that's kind of the same question. So I'd love to uh, toss it over to um, you know, some of our organization leaders. Maybe we'll start with um, Ali, talk a little bit about you know, what role does black and brown leadership within the organizations play in this conversation? Well, I think first and foremost, I have to acknowledge that I'm a white leading an organization. I see another white woman and a bunch of white men. So there's a lot of um, space that, that we need to make and um, acknowledgement of the situation that most institutions are not run by people of color. But, um, you know, our leadership team, I'm really proud to say, is um, 50 50% white, 50% people of color. And I think what's more important is representation on the board, right? They're ultimately responsible. And something that we've been working toward um, improving upon is not only um, race and ethnicity, but we need artists on our board. And um, it's important if we're gonna be an arts organization to make sure those voices are represented. So that's something, you know, from, from a representation standpoint and equity standpoint is really important to us too. Absolutely. Thank you for that perspective. Um, Todd Smith, I'll ask the same question of you. Can you talk a little bit about the role of black and brown leadership inside your organization, the way that plays in this conversation, maybe a visions or steps being taken at your organization? Right. So one of the things when I was interviewing for the job that really was stood out to me was the diversity on the museum's board. And um, I really want to applaud the, the, the Beckler's vision for that over the last decade. It really is, I think, one of the most, um, for an institution of its size, one of the most diverse boards that I've ever either worked for or been in, been associated with. So, so I'm happy that we can report that. We have quite a bit of ways to go in terms of our staff, um, so that our staff reflects this community. Um, but at this point, I'm very happy, at least with, with where the board sits. Absolutely. Thank you, Todd. Um, Alexis, uh, talk to us about this topic over at the Gantt. I'm just a little different again. I believe since it says an African, you know, as an African American arts and cultural center, I, I, we kind of naturally do get a little uh, more people of color. Um, anyone, of course, can apply. Um, but I do want to acknowledge, shout out, give kudos, however you want to call that our leaders are all black and most of the people on our staff are women. Um, so our CEO is a black man. Our CEO, Vanita Buford, is a black woman who's been running the organization and does a lot 
behind the scene work. So shout out to her. And um, we just have really almost an all uh, black staff at times. But of course we do have others, but just a shout out to that and the women who are really holding it down. Both our vice presidents are both black ladies um, and also multi-generational, right? Um, that's a big thing too. So making sure that we break that multi-generational thing of bringing in people of all different ages. Um, I do remember at one point when I first started as an intern and uh, became my first year at the Gantt Center in 2014, I was one of the youngest people um, there. But now it's so many people from their 20s, 30s, all the way, different age groups. So that's really important. And um, how my bosses, my CEO and COO gave me a chance to run an exhibitions and collections department at such a very young age and what I've been able to accomplish because they said, you know what we are, we do believe in you, we're going to take a chance on you. And I think that's what across the board, you know, if you do that with a lot of your employees that you already have or reach out, you'll be surprised at what you can yield. Um, so I do have to give a shout out to, to them and the Gantt Center for really running amazing things. And again, if you look at the staff, it's mostly ladies on there. Well, let's hold that up as a model for what, you know, so many organizations could, could take uh, uh, inspiration from that, certainly. Um, I think this is a really important topic, so let's go ahead and, and uh, you know, touch on our other two organizations on this one. Amy Herman, I'll toss it over to you. Talk to us a little bit about uh, how Goodyear is, um, uh, you know, sort of approaching Black and Brown leadership and it being reflected on the staff and leadership of your organization. Yeah. Um... I mean, I think again, as Ali kind of pointed out, like I am a white woman and so is my other co-director, Susan, um, and we're really aware of that, but there's only four people that work at Goodyear Arts and of those four people, one of them is a black woman where we respect her and we listen to everything that she has to say. Um, and in addition, we listen to sort of two different boards. Um, one's not really a board, but the collective, which is, I would say 50% people of color, if not more. Um, and then our board, which is also made up of a diverse group. Um, you know, I think that there's always more work that can be done and we should continue to do this work and we need to grow our diversity in every single one of those sections. Um, since we don't really have any money to hire anyone, including like the people who work for Goodyear currently, <laughs> we don't get paid sort of what we should. Um, I don't know that we'll be hiring more people anytime soon, but I think that if we do hire people in the future, it's gonna be definitely looking at trying to become even more diverse. Yeah, absolutely critical. Um, Todd Herman, we'll, we'll land uh, the final question, uh, for this question over, over to you through the Mint's perspective. Uh, how is this uh, playing out over in your organization? Uh, yeah, so I can um, echo some of the things that have already been mentioned. Um, it wasn't lost on me um, on this panel, the leaders of the arts organizations you know, are all white and that is just indicative of sort of a national issue and a national problem. Um, and at the, at the Mint Museum, um, I will, uh, let's see. So for the board, we are probably, I would say 20% uh, people of color on the board, but the executive committee of the board, which is the body that is sort of the heads of all the different committees. So sort of the, you know, the, um, uh, the smaller group that can speak for the entirety of the board is 50%. Uh, people of color. So um, while the overall makeup of the board is not where we would like it to be in terms of percentage, um, at the upper echelon of the board, uh, it is 50%. The staff is a little bit of a, of a different animal because the uh, the senior leadership, of which there are, are eight of us, um, is all white. At the, at the next, the management level, um, that's where we see sort of a lot of people of color at, at that level um, of the organizations. So what we need to do is work on sort of moving people of color up the ladder, up into the senior leadership positions. And we are looking at a lot of ways to do that. And part of that is sort of building, uh, building the pipeline. Um, so we're not just kind of at the end trying to you know, trying to fill a, fill a position, um, but starting at the beginning with, 
kids coming out of high school or out of college who are maybe thinking about going into museum work or, or maybe a little bit unsure. Do I have to do I have to get a master's degree and a PhD? You know, like what and, and starting there and building building the the capacity um, at the beginning instead of instead of being wringing your hands at the end let's be an agent for change at the beginning. So we're looking at how we can do that. Um, but yeah, but we, we know we know we have, we certainly have work to do. Thank yeah. you for giving that perspective. Ohavia, back to you. Absolutely, I mean, all of these perspectives are so good and I just love the real talk that's happening for sure. Um, to your point, Todd, uh, we got a good question from Lydia and I just wanna to touch on the university side of things as well because that's, that's something that we don't think about often too. So Lydia asked a good question, she said, what can universities do to further develop and support your organizations and institutions? So Todd, I would like to just toss it back over to you because you brought it up and it was a good segue. Um, how can universities play a part in further developing and supporting your organization and institution? I think you're on mute. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you met. Oh, I forgot we have okay. Todd squared. Yes, yeah. Todd. <laughs> I, I'm sort of I'm sort of doubled up here because there are two Todds and two Herman. Right. Right. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm here twice a lot. Um, so I think universities, um, you know, we have internship programs, as, as I'm sure sort of everybody on this on this panel does. Um, and what we need to do, I think, is work closely. And I think I think Lydia's on this. Yeah, L Lydia's here. And you know, we want to work with UNCC, we want to work with Queens um, on sort of, I don't want to get too much on a soapbox, but I, I kind of, I kind of feel it coming on, um, <laughs> soapbox moment of, um, go, 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 go. Because I, you know, I, in thinking about this a lot, I, I kind of, you know, the arts in general, and maybe not everybody here agrees with me, but, but it, it just feels like um, it's hard to get people to come into the field when even sort of passive jokes are still being made about people going into arts careers. Yeah. You know, like it, it comes, you know, it's still, it's still kind of a, of a punchline. Oh, your kid's going into the arts, you poor thing. I hope you're fixing up your basement for them, <laughs> right? I mean, if we can kind of get out of that line of thinking and more toward the arts are a viable career. Uh, you know, you can you can really make a difference, and you can be fulfilled as a person by going into the arts. Um, I think it kind of needs to start with almost sort of a of a, a a much bigger change in attitude about the value of the arts, the value of artists and people who work in the arts, um, instead of it being seen as you know something sort of off to the side or something to be. Um, something that you would fall back on if you can't do anything else. Yeah. Right. I mean, because I, I think even sadly, so sadly, um, even Barack Obama in a speech kind of gave a dig at art history um, as a as a um, as a major. And it it just kind of keeps kind of cropping up. And I think we really need to get past that. So people aren't afraid to go into it as a career. Mm, that's deep. That's really good. And I have to find that quote too, Todd. Uh, only because, like, I I will say this: when I was in college, I remember he later even being apologized. A... He later apologized. Oh, <laughs> okay. You must have felt like my journalism sense is tingling. I was like, I got I'm on it. <laughs> no, but you, like you know, it, well, you speak to something that's real yeah, though, Todd. I remember being right. in college and even being a communications major, an art major, yeah, yeah, yeah. and just kind of that essence there. It's really real. So thank right, you for sharing yeah, that perspective. Yeah. I want to toss it back over to our amazing artists um, with some panel questions that we had submitted right from you all. Um, and I've been scrolling because literally the chat is booming and we love to see it. So many awesome perspectives and comments being made. I would encourage everybody to scroll and read. Um, so there's been an awesome uh, question asked from for our artists. How can we work together? I think this is also a good ending too, Matt. What do you think? But I'm gonna go ahead and shoot my shot here. How can we work together to engage the public in our conversations? and? change their habits. How can we turn that selfie in front of that artwork into work to progress our communities? That's good. I don't even, I mean, that everybody can answer that one. I'm gonna start with you, Stacey. Um, how can we work together 
to engage the public in our conversations and change their habits? And how can we turn selfie and artwork into work to progress our community? Yeah, the selfie in front of the artwork thing kind of like it, it, it kind of stuck with me. That kind of bothered yeah. me a little bit because you do have you uh, you have I've been at events before where you have people come there and they're like, hey, I want to take a picture with the artist. Yeah. And like, do you understand what I'm doing, why I'm doing it? And and and, and, and it's just it kind of stops there. Yeah. I think the main thing, it, it kind of goes back to what Todd, Todd Herman was saying, you know, when it comes to the arts, it's about education. You know, we are I think as artists, we have a responsibility to tell, tell a truth. Yeah. And it's a truth that um, may be personal to us, but can resonate to others. And I think that's why you have people responding to artwork in, in such a way. And I, and I think what we can do as artists and what can institutions and organizations can do together is make sure we create, kind of create that platform uh, for education so that people know, you know, why are artists doing the work that they're doing? Why are they creating the sculptures that they're creating? Why are they working in these public spaces? What is the, the content? What is the narrative behind their work? when you understand that you can look at a, 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 an art piece differently and see a story that may resonate with you or it may remind you of something else but i think creating those platforms creating those opportunities where people can understand what it is that they're looking at and how they're how they're looking and, and responding to art um, because other than that you're just somebody with a phone for you know just taking a picture in front of an art piece and not really understanding the breadth of work that you know of, of research of experience of training of um, late nights and money spent in buying supplies to create artwork, you know? So I think, you know, creating an opportunity for education is very, very important so that, you know, we can turn that selfie into knowledge and they go tell somebody to go, not take a picture of it, but to actually go look at it and experience for themselves. No, 100%, Stacey, and I do want to put a plug in. So again, reporting live from Duff and Swat, only a few steps from, you know, the We Are Hip Hop mural here in Camp right. North. And it's funny because it's easy for people to, you know, pull up and take selfies, but like there was a lot that went into making that happen. And not to mention even introducing like Charlotte to him pop culture and all the things like art really does stand in a gap for a lot of the things that we don't know how to say or introduce. So right. made and, yeah. And people don't understand, you know, the, the intellectual, you know, the intellectual, uh, you know, intellectual property, you know, that, that went into creating that, you know, we just don't wake up with the design. Um, it's a blessing the day that you do. But, you know, other than that, it's, it's, it's a life, life's work of experience that goes into the artwork that we create. Yeah, 100%, Stacey. Alexis, I want to toss this question over to you as well, is how can we work together to engage the public in our conversations and change their habits, right? So how can we turn that selfie in front of artwork into work to progress our communities? It's, again, um, the constant thing about how to break down the museum walls, right? How do we understand that the museum is meant for everybody? And that includes reaching out, doing the programs. Um, again, representation's big. If people see something that looks like them or they identify with, they're gonna dig a little bit deeper um, on multiple levels, right? Not only the artists, but what about the philanthropists who are here? People know like, hey, we do have philanthropists who are donating to the arts and understanding, hey, the arts are important. Um, that is huge. Uh, we do have philanthropists on this call right now who they donate to us, whether it's through um, funds or through artwork itself. Dr. Judith Diamond and Patrick Diamond's on this call right now. I can't help but to shout them out because they not only donated to the men, but they've actually showed they donated to us and had a whole collection. So now people are coming in, not only seeing artwork, but they're seeing that, wow, there are black collectors out there who's doing this. Um, at the Gantt Center, we often try to put plug and play to make it very relatable. Uh, there was a Jay-Z lyric to make it relatable for the students who talked about on the 444 album, yeah. how he bought an artwork, right? For one year worth 1 million, two years later it's worth 2 million, three years later it's like 8 million, whatever that lyric goes. But to relate it to the importance of artwork, maybe as an investment, yes, but also the importance of, hey, this is something that you can pass on. This has been sharing stories for different, multiple generations for centuries this has been going on on and to also just see again the arts are important um the last thing you got to notice we did have something on the ballot a few years ago that would have helped a lot of arts organizations and it didn't pass so yep. instead of like going down like hey you didn't vote for this people didn't know about it and they don't know the importance of the arts mm -hmm. and so how can we again make sure that people understand it is important I think we constantly have to break down the museum walls we have to have these conversations we need to have again more funding Charlotte Mecklenburg school seventh grade students used to be able to go to two out of the three museums that stopped and that was a big gateway for the introduction to young students 
to then form this pathway to maybe in the future become philanthropist or like me, I was introduced to the museum world. And because I had opportunities, I then dove into this nonprofit life that's, that's become my life. So these are all the things that we have to do um, together collectively on many different formats. And that's how we're gonna un understand the importance of the arts in Charlotte. Oh, wow. 100% so good breaking the museum wall for sure because a lot of times you know we get into our silos and like Charlotte has got some plaque for that getting into those silos and those circles and staying there but now's the time so eloquently put by you Alexis is let's break it down like let's collaborate let's come together um I want to toss this to you uh Todd Smith um how can we work together to engage the public in conversation happening at the Beckler or change their habits and even when we talk like the work that you see at the Beckler how can we take many of those works put it in the community and progress many of the things that are happening from your perspective I mean if you look at where Charlotte sits I mean having been other places in the last 20 years Charlotte is, is very much ahead of many cities of its same size so I mean I think there's a lot of work still to be done of course but I mean I think we should take stock of 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 the success I mean, the fact that the arts organizations represented here even exist, which they didn't some of them 20 years ago, 15, 10 years ago, that there is this dialogue happening. I think that's something to be extremely proud of. And, and that should be a positive message that goes forth as we talk to our supporters, whether it's the Mint supporters, Goodyear supporters, our supporters, they share a common interest in making sure that this community is thriving with culture. And that has to be that positivity has to be part of the conversation too. Like, I think if, if all we're seeing is as wanting more and more and more without respecting what we have, then we get into a trap. And I think it, it turns some people away from the conversation. So as much as we can focus internally on, on making changes, but externally focusing on selling a positive message, then we can move forward, I think, together in a very, very important way. No, you said very good, moving together in a very important way. Uh, Dave, I wanted to ask you this. How can we work together to engage the public in, a con in our conversations and change their habits? How can we turn that selfie in front of artwork um, into work to progress our communities? Um, I think uh, it starts with understanding people. Um, as someone who doesn't have any formal art education, as someone who doesn't who, who has kind of like more of an understanding of business and growing in my creative understanding and, and, you know, applying these things and learning more about art and just doing that independent study to be able to get to this point. I think we have to understand people. I think it's important that we understand that um, people are simple and we need to make things as, as easy for them to be able to participate as possible when you talk about the general public. Um, so with that being said, knowing that the, that the internet and access to technology and all these things have created an environment that um, has quote unquote kind of flattened the earth in a, in a sense, um, or opened the floodgates, if you will, and given access to a lot of people to do a lot of different things, we can now start to challenge a lot of the traditional definitions of things and how institutions are defined and how um, artwork is perceived in narratives around artwork um, and, and creativity. And I think that you only get to that point where you can start to educate people if you can keep them, if you can keep their attention. Um, you know, it's 2020 and people have, the world in their in their palm or in their back pocket or in their pocket and if you can't keep up with the pace of what's in their pocket then they're not going to participate in what you have going on if you can't tie what's what's tangibly in front of them to what's in their pocket then they're not going to know they're not going to um you know pay attention or be interested in what's going on so we have to radically think about how we can um create change in these environments and opportunities to tie different elements of culture together and truly innovate um on some of these things and still yes use these things as um use what we have built and what has existed um, you know, as, as, a, as a foundation, but especially in Charlotte, there's an opportunity to radically do things different, to radically um, incorporate industries and get industries to, to, um, to innovate and, and collaborate and, and, and cross-pollinate ideas so that there's much more interest in things that are going on as opposed to working with the traditional system that a lot of our institutions were founded on and a lot of our, um, you know, art practices are founded on as well. I think it's up to not only the institutions, but the artists to educate themselves on how to appropriately um, really exist in 2020. Um, and then uh, then you can start to trickle down to the patrons. If you know um, you know who you're talking to and who your demographic is and who your artist, who your um, audience is, then you can know how to speak to them appropriately. And that's why I know for the folks that are into the things that I'm into, um, to bring them into these spaces, there has to be a lot of change um, in how we think about these spaces and how we enter these spaces into the things that we consider that are quote unquote worthy to be in these spaces there has to be a, a lot of um, a difference as it relates to that 
No, 100% Dave. See, that's why your, your nickname is Dave Has Wings, because you completely flew into that thing and offered a perspective, and we so appreciate it. But you said something so good about industries and innovation and collaboration is realizing that everybody has to be a part of this conversation for sure. Krista, I want to toss it over to you, love. Um, how can we work together to engage the public in our conversations and change their habits? How can we turn that selfie in front of artwork or any work in general here in Charlotte to work to progress our communities? Um, before I answer that, I have to give some hats off to some Black leadership in Charlotte that I think is just so incredible. I mean, the McCall Center had C. Scott for a very long time, and so did the Gantt Center. Charles Thomas is now head of the Knight Foundation. He used to be my student, then my coworker. Now I write grants to him. You know, Lydia Thompson, who started this, some of these conversations I think was incredible of bringing up a lot of things. And UNC Charlotte is one of the most diverse places I've actually ever worked. Um, at UNC Charlotte, I would have to say is where I really learned to challenge the paradigm of the distance audience. and. Um, with a colleague of mine there, Meg Whalen, we used to also really work very hard on making some area of our programming just open to what needs to be now. You know, there has to be a place for a pulse. Yeah. All of these institutions, I, and I, I love them, they have to have two year schedules or more. Within that two year schedule, there has to be a place to jump into the COVID when it happens. Yeah, you know, to jump into the Brook Hill, which you, some of you guys did really well when it happens, to jump into social justice. I mean, and hopefully stay there, right? <laughs> um, but so I think that creating a platform that is clear, you know, when you have this really incredible art that's challenging, you also have to tell your public how to understand it. You, you can't assume that they always know it. And actually, I've taught enough art appreciation at this point <laughs> that um, I know, you know, people are very afraid of art. You have to help them be unafraid. You have to make it approachable for them. You have to build your bridges all the time yeah. and take away the, the pompousness of it and really show that, you know, these are sometimes canaries in the coal mine, mm. singing a song that needs to be heard that we all need to listen, it's about all of us. Yeah, you said something so good, Krista, about we all need to listen. And it reminds me of what Amy said earlier, we don't all have the answers. The best way that we can truly iron sharpen iron is by leaving that safe space open to lead with love and listen to one another, for sure. Um, so y'all, when I tell you, I wish we had more time. Okay, I wish we had more time, Matt. I know, I know. We. I literally have so many questions that we just are not getting to. Literally. Uh, but but <laughs> that's that's the deal. That's the dealio. So here's how we're gonna end. I'm gonna I'm gonna toss to each of the three artists just to say a brief final words, and then we'll end uh, just with a couple of final housekeeping uh, items. So let's start with Stacy. Stacy, final words on this conversation and the show. Well, um, in regards to the show, um, I think this show, I've been talking to Sonya for, I think maybe almost a year, a little over a year, actually, in terms of preparing for this show. And I think that it, um, it's funny how things kind of develop and the way that it developed and what it turned into, I think was appropriate for the time that we're in right now um, to address things. And I also think it was really cathartic for us in a lot of ways, um, for us while we're being quarantined to, um, to really push ourselves artistically and to address some things that maybe we have been kind of waiting to address. Um, and so this um, is, has been great and this conversation has been great because it's, it's been a pleasure to be um, you know, on here with you guys as well as with Krista and Dave, um, getting a chance to know them um, individually and, and, and hopefully at some point in their future to, together, all together to talk, um, as well as, as, as institutions um, to be able to have this conversation. Um, so I really, I really appreciate um, the opportunity to be up here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Daisy, we appreciate you as well. Krista, uh, just a few final words from you, please. Um, I could say that Dave Butler could teach all artists a lot about uh, valuing themselves. He schooled me a little bit after the show, so I learned a lot from him. I've learned a lot from Stacy. I re really appreciate the courage of Sonia to be a commercial gallery and mm -hmm. to have a, you know, to steward a conversation like this. You know, a commercial gallery is a capitalist notion, you know, <laughs> that's not easy. She is way more than a capitalist notion. And I think that that's 
you know, she does that because that's what she believes in. She believes in these narratives and these stories and changing the world. And I, I give kudos to her for being so courageous. And it's always good for us artists to have to stretch. So I appreciate stretching with Stacy and Dave and being a part of them. I really enjoyed it. And being a part of this conversation, you guys did it just lovely. Well, thank you so much, Krista. And over to you, David, for your final sort of thoughts about our conversation tonight. No, definitely. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Thank you, Sonia, for um, you know reaching out. Uh, it's been amazing to work with um, you know some very seasoned artists that have a lot to offer, a lot of perspective, um, and kind of they they did an amazing job of making me not feel like the rookie <laughs> in the show. Um, it was dope to be able to just be around the folks that were like, nah, like, you know what I mean? Like, you should, you know, you got it. Just keep doing what you're doing. And um, so I, I'm very appreciative to Stacy and Krista for that, for that support. Very appreciative for the sign for the opportunity. Um, the conversation is ongoing, right? And I think that um, as Charlotte continues to grow, it's not, it's not going to be anything but a, a, a bigger conversation and how we as a city and our mainstream consciousness address art, creativity, um, creative industry, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm committed with myself, my partners over at Hugh House, um, you know what I'm saying? And the homies, we all committed to making sure that Charlotte has um, what it needs from, a, from an ecosystem perspective for artists and institutions alike to be able to thrive and to be able to, you know what I'm saying, do it, do what's necessary um, to make sure that Charlotte is known uh, for the creative talent that it actually possesses. So, um, you know, thanks to everybody who plays a role in the community, whether you're working at, you know what I'm saying, an institution or whether you're working at, um, a university or whether you, you know, whether you are just taking that selfie in front of it, like all of that plays a role um, inside, inside of what we, what we build as a creative community and as a creative economy. So um, I just want to give a shout out to, shout out to y'all, shout out to everybody who took the time, the 70 people, you know what I'm saying? At one point that was on this call, um, everybody plays a role. So, um, you know, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, David and everything you're doing alongside so many other folks here in, in, in the community, you know, addressing the concerns that, you know, Charlotte organizations might have about having more exhibition home, like off the plantation, like classic black, like, and even important pieces in the community, like the Black Lives Matter mural, you know, all of these, uh, all the efforts of the people on this call are, are vital to making that uh, possible. And, and, and the things that we talked about as well this evening, I mean, diverse leadership on staff, yeah. and, staff and boards and championing art activism and things like that. So, um, Ohavia, tossing it to you to close us out, maybe thank everyone and let's encourage folks to follow these amazing artists. No, absolutely, Matt. And first things first, I just wanna say, Matt, it has been amazing working with you tonight. And also shout out to the city of Charlotte, so beautiful. It's a pleasure serving you all and I love y'all. Also big ups to all of our amazing artists and the organizations represented. Literally y'all are truly the heartbeat. When we talk art, art is the heart. So what I did there, um, but truly here's what I need y'all to do. You really wanna make my heart smile, follow these artists, uh, Dave, Krista, Stacy, follow them, but not only follow, I need you to pull up, okay? Pull up on their work at Elder Gallery. It is there, go take a look, and not just take a look, right? But seriously, ask yourself some of the questions. What is it that you're gathering from any of these pieces? I think back to Dave's piece with the puzzle pieces and seeing like places like Waffle House. And, and you know, there was a field with like a, a church in the background. These are all things that play a huge part, not only in Charlotte culture, but for the culture in general. So follow these people also so into them, right? So money talks, money definitely talks. So any little bit helps, feel free to sew into them. Um, I believe our chat master will drop those in there. They were up earlier, so y'all might have to scroll. But follow our artists, support our artists, back our artists. Now's the time more than ever for us to continue to collaborate. Remember that it's communities over clout, it's opportunities over photo ops. And now's time for us friends to take this conversation and continue the good work. So I love y'all. Matt, I love you, thank you, Matt. Love right back at you. And thank you to all the panelists tonight and for everyone who tuned in. Go see home, support, and, uh, and, and hire, and, 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 and uh, buy this work. It's beautiful yes. stuff.